Good morning, everyone. We're here to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. We have no other agenda than to lift up our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to pray this morning and give this time to the Lord. And, and I'm so thankful that for you being here today. I'm so thankful that we can be in the house of God to worship our Lord and Savior. Amen. Pray with me if you would. Father, we thank you for this day, Lord Jesus. Oh God, we love you. We thank you, Lord God, that you said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. I pray be glorified and lifted up in this hour, in this nation, God, in the, in the world today, Lord, in this church, Father. This is your church where your people washed in your blood and called by your name, God. Be exalted. Draw many into your kingdom and use your people to do it, Lord, to preach your gospel of salvation, Lord. Speak to our hearts, God, this morning. We need you, Lord. If we ever needed the Lord before, we sure do need you right now, God. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. It's good to see you. I want you, if you would, to turn with me in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, verse 26. We're just going to read this one verse for time's sake. I believe you'll understand the uh, account of what we're reading from this one scripture. Daniel 3, 26. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spake and said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the Most High God, come forth and come hither. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came forth out of the midst of the fire. Now there's so many wonderful sermons we could preach from that one scripture and from that passage of the three Hebrew boys in the fiery furnace. But we are doing a series on the priesthood of the believer. The priesthood of the believer. This is our third part. If you've missed one of the first two parts and want to go back, they're on YouTube and on the web. Uh, the website as well. And the, the King Nebuchadnezzar called these three Hebrew young men servants of the Most High God. And that is such an honor. Today we're going to talk about in our, in our sermon on the priesthood of the believer what a, some of the duties that we have and the responsibilities, but also what an unbelievable honor it is to serve the Lord. To be a priest unto God. To be a servant of the Most High God. And if you're taking notes uh, through this series, and I would encourage you to do so, one of our main scriptures or key scriptures for the whole series is found in Revelation chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, where it says, and I'm, I'm quoting part of it, he says, Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests, unto our God and God through salvation through the washing of the blood of Jesus as that any man turns to Christ and puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ there are so many things that God does for us and in us at that moment there's it is so great salvation like the Bible speaks of but one of the things he does is he makes us kings and priests unto God and to our father to his father and so we're priests unto God. That's really what we're focusing on. The Bible says, for ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are kings and priests, and, and he's also making us, growing us in our position as a priest unto God. But these three Hebrew boys served the king, and they served in the foreign land of Babylon where they were, had been taken captive, and they faithfully served, but they were servants of the Most High God. They served the king, and they did faithfully what they were called upon to do, but when it came down to ultimately who they served, are we going to obey God or men? Are we going to bow down to the idol, the 90-foot statue that's set up in the plain? of Dura there that all the, the leadership was commanded to bow down to or, or be thrown in the fire, well, we're going to choose to serve God. They were bold about it. They were, weren't disrespectful about it, but they told the king, we're not going to bow down. We're not going to bow down to your idol. Our God will deliver us one way or the other, but he's going to deliver us 
one way or the other. If we go in that fire and die, or if he protects us somehow, we don't. But we're not bowing down to your idol. God did a miracle, miracle of all miracles, and protected them. He was the fourth man in the fire with the Hebrews. But just for our purposes today, the king, the lost pagan, prideful king, recognized the priesthood, if you want to call it that, the priesthood, the service of these three young men unto Jehovah God. You servants of the Most High God, come out of that fire. And they came out, and of course there was no harm to them, there was no hurt to their bodies, their clothing, nothing from the fire, because the Lord supernaturally protected him as he protects his people that stand for him, amen? Even in death, he's protecting us because he brings us home to be with him. But that word servants, I want to talk about it for just a moment. The word servants is, is from the, uh, it means bondman, bondman, to become a bondman or a worshiper. It comes from the verb abad in the Hebrew, which means to do, to make, to prepare, to execute, to work, to enslave, to become bondmen. And then the verb, the uh, noun tense would be a worshiper. I thought that was amazing. And we are servants of the Most High God, like these three Hebrews. We may uh, be faithful at work, and we should be to our employer. We're faithful in front of the military, to, to commanding officers and so forth. We're faithful. We have authorities over us. But our ultimate uh, accountability and our ultimate priesthood and service is that we're servants of God. We're servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, he's made us priests unto our God and our King. What an honor. What a privilege to be a servant of the Most High God. History is full of them. We read about them in Hebrews chapter 11. You and I might not be known in the, uh, to other people, but we're known unto God. If you're born again, He knows you. He loves you. He's made you a king and a priest unto Himself. And our ministry and our service is to be unto the Lord. We're worshipers of the Lord. We're faithful in other areas of life where we should be. But if there's ever a discrepancy of it about, between a commandment of man and a commandment of God, there's no question we obey the Lord and we serve the Lord. Amen. But what an honor. There's not a higher position. If you're elected president, if you were appointed king, if you're appointed CEO of a company, there's no higher privilege or honor than being a servant of the Most High God. The Lord has made us a king and a priest unto himself. Anything else would be a demotion. If I'm serving the Lord and I step down from that in order to serve men or take some other position and put my ministry to Christ on a back burner somewhere to where it's not as important, I have, I have been demoted, not promoted. Amen? There's not a higher call than serving the Lord. Again, I think that men, men of this world, lost men, take little notice of the men of God and the women of God. They take little notice or care for what concerns us, for our ministry to the Lord, for our sacrifice unto the Lord and so forth. They, they don't notice, and what they do notice, many times they ridicule, they demean, they mock, uh, they despise. But our God notices, amen? Our God notices. It's important, it's important to our Heavenly Father. It's important to our Lord and Savior and our friend who sticks closer than a brother. How we serve the Lord. He does take notice and he cares. And he cares for us when it's hard to serve God. And he cares for us when others despise and ridicule and mock and persecute and overlook and demean. He cares. This is not a pity party, but we're, we're, there's not a higher honor than like those three Hebrew boys being servants of the Most High God. Men are too busy building their kingdoms. Talking about lost men. Too busy building their kingdoms on this on this sinking sand, it's going to pass away. Jesus said in, through in John chapter, uh, John said in John chapter two, first John chapter two, and the world passeth away in the lust thereof, but he that does the will of the Father abides forever. So all the kingdoms and all the kings of this world and all the sinking sand that they're building upon, it's all going to pass away. But guess what? Our ministry to the Lord. It's, it lasts forever. Our life with the Lord lasts forever. 
The Bible says well, he that believes on the Lord has passed from death to life. So we have the gift of eternal life through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross and our priesthood to the Lord and our service to God is also eternal. That is ongoing. I want to read a couple of scriptures here. You know, in a year from now, we'll still be priests unto God, servants of the Most High God. In, a, in 10 years, if the Lord tarries, and a thousand years, when we're long gone from this earth, we'll still be priests unto God and forever and ever. Just listen to these passages from Revelation uh, that I want to read. Chapter 20, verse 6, first of all. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection that's born again men and women. On such the second death hath no power, but they, those blessed people of the Lord, they shall be priests unto God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. That is the, during the millennial reign of Christ, the literal reign of Christ on this earth. Now, chapter, Revelation chapter 22, verse 5. In the eternity of eternities, in that eternal state of a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem that the Lord has will prepare and, and, and will have the privilege of living in forever. Listen to this, Revelation 22, 5. There shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they... The, the children of God who have been washed in the blood of Jesus and made kings and priests unto God in this life, in that life to come, they shall reign forever and ever. That is the heritage of the believer. That is the heritage of God Almighty that He has given to us that have put our faith and our hope and our trust in Him. What on this earth could compare to that? What would you exchange what earthly or worldly gain or riches or power or prominence or comfort or ease or luxury, what would we exchange that we could possibly compare to what we have in Christ? Being a servant of the Lord is far better than being a king in this world. Being a servant of the Lord, nothing can compare. We are His and we're His forever. We serve the Lord now. We'll serve Him during the millennium. We'll serve Him after the millennium forever and ever. And there's not a greater joy. There's nothing that compares to that. So what does our ministry look like? If we're servants unto the Lord, bondmen and worshipers of the Lord, to do, to execute, to prepare. Remember, that's what the word serve means here. To work, to enslave. In a practical sense, what does that look like? What is a priest unto God in this life that's been washed in the blood of Jesus look like, behave like? What is our character? What is our service? What do we do? What do we not do? Uh, well, I think it can be summed up biblically by this. We represent the Lord Jesus Christ among men. Our service is defined from the Word of God. We have to go to the Bible. We cannot just go based on somebody else thinks a Christian ought to live this way and serve the Lord this way. We go to the eternal Word of God because He tells us what it, our service and our priesthood is to be. Our service is defined by the Word of God. Our service is defined by knowing the will of God and doing the will of God on this earth and doing it for the glory of God. That everything we do, we do for the glory of God. Is this our priesthood? Yes, this is our priesthood. We do the will of God, not our own. We have to know what it is. We go to the Word of God. We go to the altar. We go on a, we live a life of prayer before the Lord, on our knees before God. The Holy Spirit speaks to our hearts. The Holy Spirit speaks to the body of Christ as a whole. And the Holy Spirit speaks to the individual believer. He is our good shepherd. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And I lead them in and out. And they find pasture. Amen. So our priesthood, we have to know the will of God. We need to do the will of God. And we need to do what we do, whatever we do, for the glory of God. Amen. I believe that what we read in the Bible that the old the priest of the Levitical order in the Old Testament, starting with Moses, uh, the law given through Moses, and Aaron and his, his sons, 
through, through the coming of Jesus Christ, where Christ fulfilled it all perfectly. But that Levitical priesthood and the Levitical priest has specific duties and requirements and, and sacrifices that they were to make. And they were the mediator and the go-between between God and the people. Between God and the people. They were to teach the ways of God, the laws of God, the statutes of God to the people. That was their responsibility. They were the ones that were to teach the law. They were to represent God before men. God, that was God's way. And they individually were not only to do the right things that God prescribed in His law, they were to be what He had called them to be. And that is separated unto God. Separated in the sense of holy and pure and dedicated and fully the Lord's. Morally and in every way separated unto God. And we're not of that priesthood. We're priests and uh, the, through the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lord fulfilled the law and that Levitical order. He's the priest. He's a priest of another order. And he's made us kings and priests of that order. But still, there's a lot of similarities. There are a lot of similarities. And one is that we are to represent God before men, before saved men and before a world that doesn't know Christ. We are to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. And y'all, we are to represent him rightly. We are to represent him as he is. We are to represent him in a manner that is Christ-like and is biblical and is befitting of such a God and Savior. Not in any old way we want and say, and live any way we want and claim to represent Christ. We have to go to the Word of God. We have to be represent him in truth. We have to be worshipers of the Lord in spirit and in truth. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 17, For as he is, so are we in this world. We're like him. The disciples as his master. The servant is as his Lord. The Christian is as Christ. We're not Christ, but we're partakers of his divine nature. The Holy Ghost lives inside of us, and we're joiners with Jesus Christ, and we are to represent the Lord as he is. So are we in this world. So we go to the Bible and we find out from the Word of God. How is Christ? How am I to be as a Christian? And we're to be separated unto the Lord. That we would show forth the praises of Him who called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. We were not a people. Now we're the people of God. We had not obtained the mercy of God before salvation, but now we've obtained it. We are to show forth His glory. It's not my own glory. It's not my own boasting before men. It is what Christ has done in me. It is what Christ has done in the life of everyone that's put their trust in Him. We are to rightly represent the Lord. And when people see us, they need to see the Lord. I don't mean that in some arrogant, lifted up way. They need to see us. They need to see someone that has been transformed the life of Christ and actually see the Lord living in and through our lives. When people hear us, they need to hear the Lord. When, when uh, the Bible says that we have, we are ambassadors for Christ. I want to read this. I know that you know the passage. 2 Corinthians 5, 20. Now then, now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. We are ambassadors for Christ, and that simply means a representative. We are on this earth, we're like in a foreign land. Just like a, a United States ambassador to China would represent every, all the interests of the United States in that foreign land. The individual ambassador does not represent their own interests, but that of the one who made them an ambassador. And it's the same for us. We're in a foreign land. We're strangers and pilgrims on this earth, the Bible says. And yet we're ambassadors for Christ. We have one job to do. To me, it's all consumed. We're worshipers of the Lord. Yes, we're servants of the Most High God. But we live for the Lord. Whether we live, we live unto God. Whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. We represent Christ. Amen. And God has chosen to reveal himself to men. He can do it any way he chooses. But he's chosen primarily to, to reveal Christ through his church, through his body. If, if 
The church is the body of Christ, and Christ is the head. There's not a better, more perfect, complete representative than the church to the world. God can reveal himself individually to people through dreams, through nature, and things that are created. He can and does that. He's not limited. Uh, but he has chosen to call the church's body, to make the church's body, over which he's the, the head. It is his life in us, and he, he is represented most perfectly to the earth in this day through the church. That's you. That's me. That's not those that are Christian in name only, but those that are born of the Spirit of God. I want to read a, a couple of scriptures here. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Let's read verses 2 and 3. Ye are our epistles. Epistle. That's a letter written in our hearts, known and read of all men. So we are epistles of the Lord. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, every believer is manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ. Ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. This is born again people. Not in tables of stone, like the, the Ten Commandments, for example, but in fleshly tables of the heart. We are that. So in our priesthood, we're to represent the Lord. He's made us that, and we need to live that way by faith and by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in our priesthood, we represent the Lord. In our priesthood also, we preach his gospel of salvation. We preach his gospel of salvation. Of salvation and we represent the Lord in our speech and in our words though for though I preach the gospel Paul said I have nothing to glory of for some necessity is laid upon me yea woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel if I do not this thing willingly and so he says if I do this thing willingly I have a reward what is he saying it's a necessity it's part of my duty to execute, to do, to work as a bond slave, to preach the gospel of Christ. It's not whether or not I feel like it. It's not whether or not that's, that's not my ministry. Uh, that is the calling of God in Christ Jesus upon our lives. That all believers are to minister unto the Lord. And one of the ways we minister unto the Lord and represent Him on this earth is by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone, by which alone men can be saved. What else do we do as a priest? What are some of our duties? We keep his commandments. Amen? We keep the commandments of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus answered and said unto him, John 14, 23, If a man love me, I know a lot of people that say they love God. The Lord knows a lot of people that say they love God. But he says, If any man love me, he will keep my words. Now keep them, we'll hold them, we'll hold to them, we'll walk in them, we'll obey them as a pattern, consistently. When we don't in sin, we ask God to forgive us and we repent and we confess and we're forgiven. But he says, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. How can we, as a priest unto God, a bond slave unto the Lord, a servant of the Lord, represent the Lord Jesus Christ if we're not keeping his commandments. Why would we say we love the Lord and I belong to him and I love him with all my heart and yet I don't do his commandments? We're not faithfully keeping his commandments and we're not, he says, the one that loves me keeps my commandments. And that's one of the ways that we represent the Lord is because we walk in accordance to the commandments of Christ, our Lord and Savior, as part of our priesthood. And it goes along with the next thing, we do His will. As priests of God, we do His will. In the model prayer that the Lord gave, we can read about it in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus says, Thy kingdom come, come, Thy will be done. How do we pray? Jesus teaches how to pray. 
the disciples said. It gave them a model. And one of the key ingredients or components of that model prayer was thy kingdom come, not my kingdom come, thy will be done, not my will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. That's a priest. That's a servant of the Most High God. We're desiring His will. We're working towards His will. We're praying and seeking His will. We're wanting His will to be fulfilled in and through us and in our day and in the earth. And however, however He chooses to use us to help fulfill the will of God on the earth. What else do we do as priests of God? We love the Lord with all of our heart. And we love men with the love of the Lord. We assemble Another thing that we do, we assemble with the body of Christ. If it's his body, we don't uh, take that carelessly or any kind of lax manner. We don't neglect the assembling or forsake the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. We gather together. That's part of our service unto God. We gather with the people of God because that's doing his will. That is what he's called us to do. And all the more as we see the day approaching. Amen. What else do we do as servants of God? We sing His praises. We don't sit there silently and listen to songs. We sing His praises and we worship the Lord. We offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and praise to God. We worship Him in spirit and in truth. We are separated unto God like the Levitical priests, but in the New Testament sense, we are separated unto God. The Bible says in Leviticus chapter uh, chapter 10, verse 7, to the Levitical priest, Sanctify yourselves, therefore, and be ye holy, for I am the Lord your God. What do we read in First Peter? Be ye holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. He's speaking to the priest of God. Who is the priest of God? Anyone that's born again? Anyone that's washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ? A couple more things. These are very general I'm not giving the specific duties of, of as much as the overall duty of the priest or the priesthood of the believer. We're to be with the Lord. We're to be with the Lord. Amen. His word says it. Jesus said, if any man serve me, John 12, 26, let him follow me. There's a lot of ifs in scripture that I talk about because it's a choice that we make. Every man doesn't serve the Lord. Every man is not born again. Every man is not going to do the will of God. But he says, if any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. And as we opened up with this morning, what greater honor than to be honored by the Lord, to be known as a true servant of God, as a priest unto the Lord. If any man serve me, he says, where I am, there shall also my servant be. So a priest of God is going to be with the Lord. We're going to be with him all the time, wherever he is. And finally, I'll mention this. As a priest of God, we're to learn the Lord and learn of the Lord. And to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's part of our priesthood. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. This is the priest of God, part of our, our duties. The priest of God must wholly, in the sense of completely, be his and follow him and not be ensnared and entangled with other things. Even good things, even things that are sort of morally neutral. We cannot be overcome and entangled by anything of this life. We have to be freed up to serve the Lord so I can serve him fully. So I jump, or be thrown in the fire rather than deny him like the three Hebrew boys did. We have to be priest unto God. And the Bible says, Paul says in the last epistle he wrote, 2 Timothy 2, 4, he says, Now no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. 
Amen. So as a priest unto God, we represent him. We are to be his mouth. We are to speak the truth in love. Our speech is to be seasoned with salt. Our speech is to be with grace. If we give counsel, it's got to be godly counsel from the word of God. It can't just be my opinion of what I think or what I saw on TV or read in a book or even a Christian book. We represent the Lord. Be sure that if we speak in his name, we're speaking to someone, giving counsel, advice, whatever it may be, that we're rightly speaking of the Lord, of the situation, to the person, what God would speak to the person. Amen. We have to be led by the Lord. We are the Lord's mouth. We are the Lord's hands and feet. What do I mean by being his hands and feet? We are his hands and feet on this earth. We are to run with those feet and walk with those feet where he leads us to go. We are to pick up and grab and help with these hands and hug and minister to and do the work with these hands that God calls us to do. If, we, if there's a wayward sheep that is a believer that's going astray and some backslidden sense and walking off into the world, we run with these feet and we pick up with these hands and we carry them back like a lost sheep and bring them back to the Lord. By the grace of God, the Lord will use us to do that and bring them back to the house of God. We, we do what he would have us to do. We are, our heart is to be with the heartbeat of God. We are to love with the love of the Lord that is only possible uh, through God's loving men through us. Amen. But we serve the Lord. We represent the Lord and we are to joyfully do the will of another. Amen. The world does not do that. I would say the world cannot do that. There might be someone that's suppressed and they have to do the will of the person that is suppressing them or an authority over them. But that's not the same as willfully and joyfully doing the will of another. But as priest unto God and service of the Most High God, that's what we do. And it is recognizable that we're joyful in serving the Lord. The Bible tells us to serve the Lord with joy, to rejoice evermore in Christ, even in heartaches, even in things that are very difficult, even in callings, specific callings of God, where there's a lot of pain and difficulty in fulfilling His will. God will strengthen us to do His will, and God will give us His joy, His joy in doing His will. We're not just doing some menial service to the Lord. We're servants of the Most High God. And in order to rightly represent the Lord in that service, I need to do it with joy. We joyfully and willingly choose to do the will of our Lord and Savior, of another. We don't always feel like it. Amen? How many of you know we don't always feel like doing the will of God? This body does not cooperate. Amen? That's why Paul says that he keeps his body and brings it under subjection so that he's not a castaway, preaching the right thing but living the wrong way. He wants to preach the right way and live the right way. And so he takes account of his body. We don't always feel like serving the Lord. I'll be honest with you. We don't always feel like being poured out again. You know what I mean? Pouring out your life unto others. Uh, we don't always feel like loving, and in many cases, not being loved back by others in return. You know what I'm talking about? We don't always feel like going back to the, the inner city or some neighborhood where uh, and preaching Christ to them and maybe seeing little fruit come from that. Going, where, going and doing something where men don't take notice or they do take notice and they don't appreciate uh, giving and we're not given back to a lot of times. Uh, we get, we don't always feel like that. It can be difficult. I don't feel like being used up for the Lord again. I don't feel like being used by men. But Paul says, I'll gladly spend and be spent for you. Gladly. Because there's a calling of Christ upon his life. Because he wasn't expecting a bunch of uh, equal measure in return. What he poured out. Oh, people will give me back as much as I, as much as I love them, they'll love me back. He said, the more I love to the church, the less I be loved. But God took care of him. God ministered to him. And God ministered to, ministered all, to all of his saints and servants and those that he's made priests unto God. We don't always feel like being poured out. But y'all, we serve the Lord. 
He gives us the strength to do it. He gives us the will to do it. He gives the heart and the mind, the grace to do it by the Holy Ghost. We belong to the Lord. We are His. And the Bible says, whatsoever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. What a lesson to learn. What a truth to not just know and quote, but to, to apprehend and lay hold upon. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward for the, of the inheritance. For you serve the Lord Christ. We serve the Lord. Now I'm bringing this to a close. We're Christ ministers. We're priests unto God. We belong to Him. We love Him. We love men in His name. But the first and greatest commandment, we love the Lord. He has the preeminence. He is above all. We live and we die as unto the Lord. We stand and we fall as unto the Lord. And God helps us. Amen? He helps us. I say, what a friend. What a, what a Savior. What unspeakable joy and what an unspeakable honor to truly be a servant of the Lord. God says, I've made you a priest unto myself and unto to my Father, Jesus says. I want to close with a couple of thoughts here. For service of the Most High God. And the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 10, the beginning of that passage, God is not unrighteous. I mean, you know that God's not unrighteous. And specifically in this way, he says he's not unrighteous. To forget your work and labor of love. Our work unto God. Our labor of love unto God. We're serving men and we're serving men in his name. But we're servants of God. God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name. And he's speaking about our ministry unto the saints of God. He's not going to forget it. The world takes little notice. And what notice the world does take of the believer and his life and his priesthood unto God is foreign to them. What notice they do take of it at all, much as with ridicule or disdain or even hatred and mockery. But God takes notice. And he is not unrighteous to forget our ministry unto Christ, our ministry unto him. He is going to reward those that diligently serve him. Moses stood before Pharaoh and all these magicians and pagans that were there and all the false gods of Egypt. He just stood there with him and his staff and he represented God. He stood in the midst of all of that darkness and spiritual uh, you know, idolatry and so forth. And he was known to the Egyptians and to the Hebrews as a servant of the Most High God. Noah, in the midst when the whole earth was, was given over to corruption and wickedness and violence and every thought and imagination of man's hearts was only evil continually. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord and in the midst of the whole planet where every single person had corrupted themselves in the moral darkness and wickedness, he was known as a servant of the Most High God. And the Bible says that he prepared an ark to the saving of his house. Amen? Prepared an ark to the saving of his house. And by it he condemned the world. Amen? Became an heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Elijah stood in the midst of one of Israel's darkest hours morally. The king was an idolater. The queen, the queen was an idolater and a worshiper of Baal. There's 850 prophets of, prophets of Baal, but all of God's true prophets had to be hidden in a cave for their own safety and fed during the famine. And Elijah stood in the midst of all of that and all of that around him and called down fire from heaven. And he was known as a servant of the Most High God. Stephen preached in the midst of stubborn and rebellious men. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised heart and in ears. Your betrayers and murderers of the just one. And they're picking up stones and throwing them at him. But he's known 
as a servant of the Most High God. Peter and John stood before the council and they testified that it was by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ that the lame man was healed. And he says, and they would preach to them and said, whom you took him with wicked hands and crucified. And they were known as servants of the Most High God. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Lastly, we mentioned what we started with, the three Hebrew boys. They didn't bow down to the idol. People might, prior to this might not have taken much knowledge or notice of these three Hebrews captive in the land. But when they refused to bow and every other knee in the land bowed and faced in the fiery furnace, and they went in the face fiery furnace and were preserved and they came out, they were known as servants of the Most High God. And I would just ask you this morning and myself, are we known as that? We just kind of blend in with the world, or are we living a life that's separated unto the Lord, sanctified unto God, seeking His will, knowing His will, and doing His will on the earth? Are we known among men, even if they despise us, are we known as servants of the Most High God? Amen? What a privilege and what an honor. I'll close with this scripture, and then we'll have our time at the altar. Psalm 84, verses 9 and 10. Psalm 84, 9 and 10. Altars open wherever you are. You are called, I would just encourage you to meet with the Lord. Lay down your life at the feet of Jesus. Say, Lord, I know you've made me your king and priest by, the, by your own blood. But Lord, I have not been living and doing your will as I should on this earth. Would you strengthen me to do it? Would you forgive me? And help me to be known as an epistle of God, known and read of men, as a servant of the Most High God. David said, Behold, O God, our shield, and look upon the face of thine anointed. For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Father, we come before you in the mighty name of Jesus. And Lord, I thank you that you've made us kings and priests unto our God. Lord, use us up for your glory when we don't feel like it in our fleshly bodies or minds, God. Make us willing, God, to be poured out unto the Most High God, to be used up for the glory of God on this earth, God. Show us how we can serve you better. Make us your kings and priests in such a way that, that we're known as being priests unto God. Strengthen us to serve you. Thank you for that honor. Thank you that we're not only your kings and priests in this life, but for a thousand years during the millennium, and then you said forever and ever, servants of the Lord who saved us by his blood. In Jesus' name, amen.